today, and I want to take one point and work on it because I think there's a lot of content to it that needs to be explored in order to understand it. So we started the second chapter, and the first paragraph in the second chapter Huh, you, you need one here. It's page four. The first paragraph of the second chapter talked about complete tshuva. The bottom of page three. What is complete tshuva? And the bottom line was a person committed a crime under very specific circumstances, and he's, he ends up in the same circumstances exactly, and this time he doesn't commit the crime, and his motivation for not committing the crime is because he's doing tshuva, not because he's afraid of being caught or even afraid of being punished, it's because he's doing tshuva. That's complete tshuva. And if he does that, he's called a Baal tshuva gemura, a master of complete tshuva. Might happen that he doesn't do tshuva until much later in his life, when he doesn't have the same strength and same abilities. If he does that, the tshuva is valid, and he's called a Baal tshuva, a master of tshuva, but not complete tshuva. Because the circumstances weren't identical. If he waits until... 20 minutes before death and does tshuva then, the tshuva is valid and he receives atonement for all of his transgressions, but he doesn't get a title. He's not a master of anything. He just did tshuva, but he did it. He did it and he gets the credit. <coughs> In the second paragraph, on page four, he says, what is tshuva? Without the word complete. And he says tshuva has three components resolving to change future behavior, regretting the past, and confession. So we asked, what exactly is the difference between the two of them? And I explained that paragraph two, which talks about tshuva alone, could be just avoiding the conditions of the transgression, what I call strategic tshuva. That's valid. That is real tshuva, and it works, and he gets atonement for everything he's done wrong. He may still be psychologically weak, so that were he under the conditions of temptation, he would fail, but he's not failing because he's very careful to make sure he doesn't go under those conditions. That's perfectly valid tshuva. To achieve complete tshuva, that requires changing your, your psychology, changing your motivational structure, adding good motivation, subtracting bad motivation, the various things that you can do. So that's the difference between the two of them. And I said, the Rambam puts complete shiva first and regular, ordinary, garden variety shiva second, even though logically it would have seemed more reasonable to do it in the opposite order, because how can you talk about complete shiva if you don't know what shiva is? A complete solution to a quadratic equation. You say, what? A solution to what? Is that how you mix the pancake batter? Not exactly. Not exactly. Quadratic equation. You know, let me tell you how you get a complete solution. You say, but I don't know what a solution is. I don't know what a quadratic equation is. And how am I going to explain what you mean when, when you talk about what's a complete one? Tell me what the thing is first, and then talk to me how to, how to make it complete. The reason why the Rambam doesn't do that is because the, our responsibility of tshuva is to do complete tshuva. First paragraph tells you that's what the Torah is telling you to do. Then the Torah says, okay, we're telling you to do complete tshuva, but the benefits of tshuva apply even when the, your performance is incomplete. You don't have to do all of it to get the benefits. There are certain things which you do which are called l'chathil. L'chathil means this is the best possible way to do it. But if you don't do it the best possible way, you may 
satisfy the requirement even without that. There are many, many dinim like that. So that's why that comes first. <coughs> now, I left you with a question yesterday. I said, given this description of regular tshuva, not complete tshuva, what would happen if in October, on Yom Kippur, a person's reviewing his life and thinking, those cheeseburgers, you know, I really should get rid of them. It's not right. It's not good. And he makes up his mind. That's it. Kashrus, uber alus. Have to have, have to be kosher. From now on, no more cheeseburgers. And he means it. But next June, when it's a three-for-one sale at McDonald's, he cracks and he eats a cheeseburger. What happens to his tshuva in, in, in October? Should I say, now we see that he wasn't being honest with himself when he said that he wasn't going to do it anymore. He was rationalizing or he was hiding something from himself because, look, he didn't keep it. And since he didn't keep it, his resolve must have been not honest or not as strong as he thought it was. It wasn't genuine resolve. And therefore, his tshuva in October wasn't really tshuva. We now see in June that uh, what he went through in October was misleading and misguided. And that means that what he did in October did not take off his responsibility for the previous cheeseburgers five years ago. Didn't work. Because in June, he lost it. Is that a correct description of the outcome of this case? And the answer, as you have probably guessed from my tone of voice, is absolutely not. And that's exactly what's uh, pre pre the precise description in paragraph 2 is that tshuva requires resolve to change. It does not require success in resolve to change. It requires resolve. And the fact that in June his resolve cracked and he went back to the same cheeseburgers does not imply that his resolve in October wasn't genuine, real, sincere, Honest, it doesn't imply that. And I'll prove it to you. Because the very idea of tshuva is that you can change. You can change and become a different, better person. Well, if tshuva rides on the idea that you could really change and become a better person, it also implies that you could really change and become a worse person. There's no guarantee that all changes are improvements. It means real changes are possible. And that being the case, it's perfectly reasonable to describe what happened is, in October, he really changed for the better, and the following June, he really changed for the worse. Both are true. Which would mean that the tshuva that he did in October is valid, and it remains, it's extant, and the atonement that he achieved in October is uh, stable, and Judy starts a new, a new account. And he starts a new account with a mistake. That is, in fact, the idea. The, the, the bottom line, the headline is, temporary tshuva can be valid tshuva. Yeah. So um, I would have to preface this with, are we working with the idea that tshuva means um, the sin is erased as if it, we, we wipe it from your record that you did this? Let's, let's work with that. Yes, it's erased. So then I, I, I may have a contradiction here. Um, I may be understanding it wrong, but I, I, I was in, uh, in uh, Shara Tshuva, Rebbein United seems to say at, in the beginning where he mentions how if you did an Avera and then you do that same Avera again numerous times, we, we view each time as if, like, it, you know, it's, he, he mentions how we give Malchus, you know, if you did an Avera 10 times, sorry, your 10th time doing it, then we give you, Malchus ten times now for that error because it's now you you did it ten times and now you did it you know, so oh so you're asking about punishment in an earthly court <coughs> tshuva has no effect on a punishment in an earthly court it does not relieve a person from the responsibility for what he has done so is your opinion then not talking about like tshuva in, in, when he's discussing this idea that each that doing an avera consecutive times, you know, is a cumulative, 
has a what? Has, it's accumulated. Well, nothing in Yoruba there, I think, says that he did shuva in between. Right, but if we're, if we're saying that, if we're saying that as long as he did tshuva, even if he does it later, we don't view this new one as nullifying the old tshuva. Right. So as I said, forget about doing it, doing it again. When you're talking about Rabbi Yonah, he's talking about punishment, right? So let's simplify the case. He only did it once, and he did tshuva. And now they have witnesses, and they prosecute him in court. Will they punish him or not? They will. So tshuva does not take off earthly punishment. Once you realize that, it makes no difference whether he did it ten times, he did tshuva ten times, or he didn't. Tshuva has nothing to do with earthly punishment. Yeah. Uh, when I'm placed into the new situation and I fail the test, do I lose forever the opportunity to complete that previous tshuva? Am I on a whole new isser? that essentially I have to do tshuva for all over again. And, and to his point, in a heavenly court... Wait, 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 wait. Let, okay. let's, let's, before, let's go into two points at the same time. Uh, I'm not following you at all. Okay. Well, one second. What I said was, he did the transgression, he did tshuva, his responsibility for that transgression is wiped out. So his tshuva is complete. doesn't need to be completed. There's nothing missing from his tshuva. His tshuva is fine. Now, when he goes back to do it a second time, I asked... Does that imply that it, that it invalidates the previous tshuva? And the answer was no. It remains complete. So you're asking, does can something X, Y, Z later complete the previous tshuva? That would imply that you lost something or it wasn't complete. I'm saying it was complete and remains complete. Well, you lost an opportunity because in order to complete a, in order to do complete tshuva, you need to be in that situation. Oh, you again. mean c- complete tshuva? Oh, no. What well, one thing has nothing to do with the other. We're talking now about responsibility and liability. We're not talking psychology. I don't know the psychology. It's, we said that in order to do complete tshuva, you have to be put in the situation again. Right. So what, why would... Now, well, if you're put in that situation again and you fail it, does that old tshuva now... Oh, I misunderstood you altogether. Okay. okay. Let, let's, let me, let's try it again. Okay. So the person did regular tshuva. Right. And, got, and now the opportunity arose to do complete tshuva, and he fails that, uh, uh, that situation. Um, it's a good question. I don't, I don't see why. Because everything that he put in place for the strategic tshuva can remain in place. So it just remains in stasis, kind of. And then maybe in the next, so he has the new isser. And then maybe in the third time, if he's tested again, he can resolve both tshuva simultaneously? No, 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 no. Okay. One second. No, it's still, it's, still, it's, still, it's still confused. It's still confused. He does the transgression. He does regular, ordinary tshuva. Right. And then he goes back and does the crime again. He loses the conditions of his ordinary tshuva. That's worse than the failing the t- test of complete tshuva. He loses it even without being put under the conditions. He seeks them out. He de- de- deliberately goes out and does the same transgressions he did before. No, I'm imagining that I know what you're imagining, but I'm telling you, if you imagine that, even that doesn't threaten his original tshuva. Even that doesn't threaten it. What you're, the case you're envisioning, envisioning is less guilty than that. It's less serious than that. Right. So obviously it's not going to, it's not going to undo his previous tshuva. But then the follow-up question was, can you resolve several, let's say, frozen tshuva simultaneously? Where did any frozen tshuva get frozen? My argument is that nothing gets frozen and nothing gets lost and nothing is incomplete. It's un- it's, if you had, if you, in order to complete a tshuva, you must be put in that situation. You, I, I, okay, I, I hear what you're, I hear, I hear now okay. where you're coming from. You're coming from the semantics of complete. So I, I, I tried to avoid that. Let me say it more, more explicitly. When you call something complete tshuva, it sounds like the other one is incomplete. So it's missing something. So then it's missing an ingredient. And if it's missing an ingredient, then it's not really tshuva because it's only part of tshuva. Right? That's, that's wrong. That's a wrong way to conceive of it. Right, and I'm not looking at that. I'm just, I'm but but, but, this, but then, then your question makes no sense. Well, so the, tshuva, you, you, if a person does regular tshuva, and then later on performs a transgression, 
right? So he's lost what he did. That is, he, he did it, and he was avoiding the temptations. He did it. He was in a strategic service, uh, uh, commitment, and he lost that commitment, and it doesn't imply anything's missing in his previous tshuva. Tshuva as tshuva, as regular ordinary tshuva, as paragraph two tshuva, is still there, full force. Right. So nothing is incomplete, nothing happens to be made up, and nothing's lost, and there's no guilt and no responsibility. Everything for that is fine. And what he did in June is a new accounting to the future. It has nothing to do with the past. The past is already rectified, taken care of. But he hasn't gotten perfect tshuva yet. Correct. That's a, that's a question of doing the mitzvah in the best possible way. But he didn't need to do it in the best possible way to rectify the past. Even doing ordinary paragraph two style tshuva rectifies the past. I, hear, I, I used the wrong word here. I never thought that he might lose what he'd done. Yeah. I only thought that he might lose the opportunity to get the perfect, complete mitzvah. And I wondered if potentially he could re- he could resolve several of these chuvas and make them into perfect chuvas simultaneously with one app. No, you don't resolve them. You don't mush them. Them. You don't do anything to them. You do a separate act of complete chuva. Doesn't make the previous ones complete. Okay. But what if they were all the same sin? Doesn't make any difference. The response wasn't the same response. The first, according to your script, the first three times was strategic. And the fourth time was passing the test of doing it under the identical circumstances. The first three remain strategic. They remain paragraph two type tshuva. They don't change. They don't need to change. You don't complete them. You do a new thing, which is called complete. But strategic can become complete when Hashem puts you in there. No, it doesn't become. It's a new action. The strategic was strategic, and the new one is, is complete. So we don't pursue strategic tshuva as something that's kind of like, well, I'm going to pursue strategic, but I'm aware that Hashem's probably or might put me into a situation to make complete. And that's like your overall perspective on the tshuva. There's no question why you can have that overall perspective. You just, you're just not describing it correctly. Um, let's see if I can give you a, a, an example. Um, yeah, let's talk about a race with hurdles. Right? And I say to the person, listen, you want to be able to run a hurdles race, First, learn how to race without hurdles. And then, after you learn to run well without hurdles, then you graduate to doing it with hurdles. That's how you do it, right? So you run the 100-yard dash in 11 seconds. That's very good time without hurdles. And now you come to run the 100-yard dash with hurdles, and you hope you break 20 seconds or whatever it is. You say, well, when you run it with hurdles, are you then completing the run without hurdles? You're making it better, the run without hurdles? You're rehabilitating the run without hurdles? No. The run without hurdles is one race, and the run with hurdles is a different race. It's a different race. It's just that you do one as a stepping stone to doing the other one. Right? When we, if you win the, hur- the race without hurdles, you won that race. Nothing's missing. Nothing's, nothing's imperfect. That's, you did what you did, and, 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 and did. there are other higher things to do. Running races with hurdles is harder, and you, and you get more credit for it. So you do regular paragraph two style tshuva, you've done tshuva, you get credit for the mitzvah, and you get credit for uh, wiping out the past. <clears throat> There's something else that's better to do, and that's complete tshuva. And hopefully doing paragraph two style tshuva will lead you to gaining the strength to be able also on another occasion to doing paragraph one type tshuva, but that doesn't complete the ones you did before. The ones you did before are what they were. And this one over here is complete. So complete tshuva is a different mitzvah altogether. No, why do you call it different mitzvah altogether? A 100-meter race with hurdles, without hurdles. It's not one is swimming and one is flying an airplane. It's, they're both running. They're running to run as fast as you can to run faster than the other guy. They're both 100, 100, meet, 100, 100 yards, right? It's just that one has hurdles and one doesn't have hurdles. That's all. So here, you're, you're adding an element to the performance. The second performance will be called complete tshuva. The prior performance is called normal, ordinary, garden variety tshuva. Each one has its own definition. Each one has its own uh, consequences. And the first three times you did paragraph two tshuva, and the fourth time you did paragraph one tshuva. So for one of era, I can do tshuva on it twice, once the strategic tshuva, and then the perfect tshuva once I'm put in that circumstance? Certainly. OK, there. Certainly. That Certainly, one. because part of the mitzvah, you know, has not been done yet. So it's not like an account. But you're not, you're not improving the previous. Right. It's a separate thing. It's not like an account that's open until you have the opportunity to do it. Okay, yeah. I see it. Yeah. You have a question? No. I think it's resolved. I was going to say, if, you know, 
know, going back to Shari, uh, Shari Chuba, like, why would Rabbi Yana only be, like, almost like just telling us halachas of, halachas of Dine Adam? Like, would he, is he not trying to show us the severity? I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't remember the, I don't remember the context there. What was he say? Do it ten times. Then you get punished uh, ten I times. I may have said the answer. Well, he never mentions that. Nest, well, I think he was bringing out the severity even in Shemayim of, of doing a Nevera consecutive times. But I think the answer was he's not talking about if he did tshuva in between. I think the Rav said that. Uh, yeah. I, 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 right. As far as I know also, yeah, he does not yeah. mention that you did tshuva in between. Then, yeah. then maybe according to this it would indeed change. Right. Right. Okay. So now I want to talk about the idea of regret. Uh, and connected to the idea of regret is a very, very important background principle to this whole discussion. I regret what I did. I wish I hadn't done it. I think all of us have had that experience, and sometimes you carry that experience with you for the rest of your life. <coughs> we started off by saying that tshuva only applies when you did something deliberately, I know it's wrong. I know what I'm, that what I'm doing violates that rule. I do it anyway. That happens, as you well know. Or I'm live. I'm, I'm negligent. I didn't know, but I had a responsibility to know. And I chose not to investigate. <clears throat> but this implies that I was able to do better. If I wasn't able to do better, then I'm not guilty. I'm not liable. No punishment is available. I don't say I'm not responsible for what I do. That's a separate issue that deals with Kant. We've spoken about that in the past. But there's no question that no penalty is, about, is, a, is, is, a, is appropriate. So the background for the whole process of tshuva is evaluating what are my capabilities. I told you two days ago, when we talked about guilt, there are syndromes of irrational guilt. I mentioned the child who thinks that he killed his parent because the parent asked him for a cup of water and he didn't give it to him. And he says three weeks later he died. He died because I didn't give him the cup of water that he asked me for. And we say that that's utterly, utterly tragic because the child's action had nothing to do with the death of the parent. He's blaming himself for it. Similarly, if we are ignorant of our own capabilities, we're liable to make two types of mistakes, one of which is relevant in this context, and that is thinking that we can do more than we can really do. And then when we fail, we say, well, I failed, so I'm guilty and then trying to do tshuva. And this will be a case of surplus guilt because since you weren't able to do better, you're not guilty. And you're not liable to punishment. Now, it's bad enough when a person is misled about his own capabilities just because he's out of touch with himself. It's even worse when <coughs> He makes his mistake about his own capabilities because he's misreading classical sources. <clears throat> he thinks the classical sources imply that he has certain capabilities, and they, and they don't because he's not reading them correctly. So I want to take uh, a couple of them and put them on the table so that you'll see a little bit how, how this works so you're not pushed too hard and into um, irrational guilt by what you'll call failures, and the Torah really wouldn't. There is a statement, Hashem Tzadik Yivcham, it's a Pasuk, Hashem uh, tests the righteous. And there's a related rabbinic idea, which you do find, that if a Kodesh Baruch Hu tests you, then you can pass the test. Wow. So, I think of the times when I've had obstacles, Difficult decisions, conflicted motivation. Not always do I make the right decision. 
And I say to myself, well, look, because Baruch will put me in this situation, because Baruch is running the world, obviously, he's testing me. And if he's testing me, I could have succeeded. So if I failed, then I'm guilty, because I could have done better. After all, because Baruch Hu created the Torah and commanded us, and because Baruch Hu created me, my soul, my body. Surely, because Baruch Hu made the commandments of the Torah appropriate for my soul and my body because I'm commanded by them. Because Baruch Hu wouldn't put in the Torah commandments that I can't fulfill, what well, would then be the point of addressing me with those commandments? So if the commandment is there, it must be that I'm able to fulfill it. That means everyone has the capacity to be perfect. Doesn't that sound a little extravagant? Does that sound realistic? Really? Everyone has the capacity to be perfect? Is everyone guilty for any failure whatsoever? You know, intuitively, it sounds very exaggerated. But what am I going to do? That seems to be what the sources are telling us. And the answer is that's not what the sources are telling us. <clears throat> Let's take the idea that it, you can pass any test that's applied to you. How do you know what's a test? The mitzvah says to do X, and I'm struggling to do X. I'm only going to be guilty for failure if I am actually able to do X. If the mitzvah applying itself to me means it's a test, and I'm told I have the ability to pass every test, then I'm being tested. And if I'm being tested, I can't pass it. If I can't pass it and I fail, it's my failure and I'm guilty. But maybe that first premise is not correct. Maybe the fact that the mitzvah applies to me doesn't mean that I'm being tested. Maybe we'll use the rule, you have the ability to pass every test, backwards. Instead of saying, well, I have the ability to do every, uh, pass every test, so since it's a test, I can pass it. Maybe I should play it backwards. Since the rule tells me I have the ability to pass every test, and I know I can't pass this test, that I, I can't pass it, I can't fulfill this mitzvah, then this mitzvah isn't a test. Instead of modus ponens, modus talens, for those who know some logic. When you know that A implies B, if A is true, B has to be true. But when you know that A implies B, if you know B is false, then you know A has to be false. It goes both ways. So if you have an independent way to determine that you, whether you can or cannot do it, then you could say, this mitzvah applies to me in these circumstances, but I can assess, I can evaluate that I'm not capable of performing the mitzvah under these conditions. And then, that being the case, the mitzvah isn't a test. The mitzvah applies, but it's not a test. That's the answer to Kant, for those who are talking about. It's not a test. I'm not responsible for failure. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not liable for failure. I'm not liable to punishment or, or criticism for failure because I couldn't do, have done otherwise. So let's just take a, a couple of examples. Right? Let's take the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. The mitzvah of Talmud Torah is written as, you have lots of mitzvahs to do. When you're not doing any other mitzvah, you have to be learning Torah. No spare time. None. No time off. Every moment has to be service of a Kodesh Baruch. Okay, rest of recreation can also be service, but it has to be exact. No extra. <laughs> so he says, okay, for my psychological and physical health, I need 63 and a half minutes off. So if I take 64, I'm guilty. If I take two hours, I'm guilty. Really, that I was being tested to do it exactly right? 
that seems, you know, a little extravagant. Uh, let's take a 13-year-old. He's just 13! He's supposed to be expect, uh, perfect right away? And any failure to live up to any mitzvah automatically means he's guilty? That's not what the sources tell us. Yeah. But wouldn't, wouldn't I just say for a 13-year-old that extra time that he needs is included in his necessary you know, time and that, that is his time when he's doing another mitzvah of giving himself his necessary his necessary, you know, off time. I mean, why, 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 why would I say that he only needs two hours of break time and he's only learning eight, so all the rest is just wasted time? Why wouldn't I say all that, being that as a 13-year-old, he can only reasonably be expected at his level to be learning, you know, you know, uh, let's say, you know, eight out of 24 hours, then the other 16 hours are his he is doing his mitzvah during those other 16 hours to do whatever other things he needs to do. Why would I have to assume that some of it is just empty, wasted time? I, 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 my point is the opposite of yours. It's, I, I'm not saying you have to assume, assume would mean in every case, that it's wasted time. All I need is that in some cases, it's wasted time. I think surely the, 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 it is not reasonable to think that every, every minute that. 13 and 14 year olds take off is really time that he would have lost his function to some degree if he hadn't taken it off. I think that's unrealistic about 13 and 14 year olds, at least the ones that I know. They, you know. they could do better, which means that some of it isn't really an investment in their overall psychological and physical health and the quality of their avoda. It's just, it's just failure. But, I mean, it's just unnecessary. I should put it that way. It's unne not justifiable. The question is whether you expect them to have a perfect record. And that's something which is... I, I, I'll give you... A, 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 that, that's a question of, of being realistic. Let me give you a raya. Let me give you a proof to what I'm saying. Um, the most direct proof... There's two proofs from the Rambam, but the, the most direct proof is this. The Rambam, in, in Hilchos Deos, where, where he's talking about your responsibility to build your character have good character traits, says, character traits come on a spectrum. There's some quality, and the two ends are too much and too little, and the appropriate character trait is somewhere in the middle. So it's very complicated. I'm not going to go into the complications on that at the moment. So for example, the attitude towards spending money. There are people who cannot spend money, even on themselves. These are people who live in the most horrible, deprived circumstances, and when they die, you find a quarter million dollars stuffed into the mattress. They couldn't even spend money on their own things that they need, really need. <clears throat> then you have, find, have people who, who can't hold on to money. They just throw money away. Uh, my wife knows a woman who is still limited in various ways, and uh, the government wanted to help people like her, so they allotted a, a monthly stipend for such people. That was crazy. She gets the monthly stipend. She goes to every store she can and buys everything she can find. And then the rest of the month she can't eat. What she needs is a daily stipend. If you give her enough for her food for that day, she'll spend it on food. Point is, if you give her the monthly, she buys enough food for the day and then she buys everything else because she can't hold on to money. So you got people who can't spend any money at all. And you got people who can't hold on to any money. Obviously, what you want to do is be in the, in the middle somewhere where you can distinguish different purchases and decide what's reasonable and what's unreasonable. So the Rambam says, suppose you are at one extreme. You can't spend a penny. You want to get to the middle. <clears throat> Both of the extremes are bad. Only the middle is good. How do you get from one extreme to the middle? Says the Rambam, the first step is to go from one extreme to the other extreme. Because you've got to break the hold of the first extreme. And the way you do that is by going to the other extreme. And after you've broken the hold of the first extreme, then you gradually move to the middle. Now let's just analyze what the Roman is telling us. He starts off at one extreme which is bad. The first step is to move to the other extreme which is bad. 
and then gradually to gravitate to the middle. Let's say it takes six months. The first instruction that he's being given is go from bad to bad and live the bad. Act out the bad. Why not? Tell him to go to the middle. Just tell him to go to the middle. The middle is where he belongs. The middle is where Kodesh Baruch tells him to be because he can't do that. He can't do it. He can't go from the screen to the middle. Which shows you that even though Kodesh Baruch tells you that you belong in the middle, you don't have the ability to get to the middle without taking a detour to the other extreme, which is bad. That means, even though Kodesh Baruch is telling you where you belong, Kodesh Baruch is taking into account that it may be a process during which time you're not doing what you should be doing. You're just going on a path to get there. It shows you that here's the case where Kodesh Baruch told you what to do, and it's acknowledged by the halacha that you don't have the ability to do it straight away. Similarly, in the beginning of chapter 5 of Hilchus Tshuva, the Rabbim says the words that we all have the power, lahatos es atzmo lederech hatov v'liyos tzadik, to incline, one can incline oneself to the good path and to be a tzadik. Now a path is a journey. The Rambam doesn't say incline himself to be a tzaddik. He doesn't even say just be a tzaddik. You have the power to be a tzaddik. No. He puts two barriers between you have the power on the one hand and being a tzaddik on the other hand. The two barriers are incline yourself and uh, to a path and then to be a tzaddik. Which means you don't have the power to just be a tzaddik. You don't have that power. So again, what we're being shown is that when Akash Baruch tells us that this is what we must do, he's taking into account that fulfilling that command may mean a process, not an immediate performance of perfection. And that's going to be now a general rule across the board, that you, you, um, you, you have to find strategies which will enable you to make the best progress that you can, but that's simply to think that you can snap your fingers. I'll give you another example. One of the mitzvahs is to love other Jews. So Rav Desta has a wonderful conscious uh, chesed, this essay on, on loving kindness, uh, where he discusses this in great detail. I'm not going to do the whole thing now, and it is recorded, but I, the bottom line is, the way you come to love people <coughs> is by investing in them. Because when you invest in someone, you come to identify with them. And when you identify with him, you want his good. You want him to be successful. And that is now an expression of, of love. But that takes time. There's a story about Rabbi Shel Salanter that he was on the train coming back to home where, where he lived in various places. I don't know where, where he was living at that time. And in those days, on the trains, there were like two benches facing each other in a cubicle, and it was cubicle after cubicle. So he was sitting there, and of course, he didn't dress any differently from any other Jew. And sitting opposite him was a young Jew who was, well, let's say inappropriately self-confident and uh, abrasive. Um, and he said things and did things which didn't show any respect for Rizal. And of course, he didn't know it was a slanter. He didn't wear a badge and say, you know, I'm one of the Gdoli Hador. So, and then Rabbi Shalantar got off and that other Jew got off at the same, at the same stop. So there were people there to greet the salon. He told one of them, you see that Jew over there? Follow him and find out what he's doing here. Came back with the report. He came here to be tested on Shechita, to become a ritual slaughterer. So Rabbi Shalom said, keep track of him. Find out what happens to him. <coughs> and lo and behold, he took the test and he failed. So Shalom sent the message to him. I understand that you failed the test. He doesn't know who he is, right? And, and the, 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 the young man who came to take the test certainly doesn't know who he's getting the message from. He gets the message. I, I heard that you failed the test, and I know you're from out of town. If you need it, I'm offering you room and board, and I'm offering to teach you the laws of Shrita so that you can pass the test. Well, he did need it. He came to pass the test. He wasn't prepared to spend months and re-educate re and so on and so on. 
So he moved him and Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. Of course, he recognized him, but he was in desperate need. So, two several months went by, so he taught him, and he passed the test. He came back, and he came to leave to go back to his hometown. He said to Rabbi Yisrael you know, I remember the train, the trip on the train. I remember what I did, what I said. I'm terribly embarrassed by, by what happened. I have to ask you, why did you take such exquisite care of me if I treated you so terribly? So Salanta said, we have a rule. Don't hate a fellow Jew in your heart. You behaved very badly to me. My practice is to forgive everyone who does that. How can I be sure that I really forgave you? That my heart was really reconciled to you? I know that if I invest in you, if I teach you the halachas of shalita, I want you to pass because you're my, my student. And I want my students to be successful. I identify with you by investing in you, and then I know that I've truly forgiven you. So the Salant is telling us, here's something the Torah tells us to do, that to forgive people, but it might not be easy, and it might require a process of three months to get there, not just... Kodesh Baruch told me to do it, so I must have the ability to do it. If I don't do it instantly, I'm guilty. And I'm, and I'm a failure, and I'm, and I'm liable for punishment. That's simply not true. <clears throat> so now, the crucial question comes. How do I know what I'm capable of doing? This is a very, very difficult question. I don't have any magic bullet here to, to, to give you a way to, to guarantee you get the information. I recommend you ask this question of other people also because other people may have ideas about this that I don't know. But I have two suggestions. One is, when you are considering undertaking a new challenge, don't commit yourself to it. Take it out as an experiment. I'm going to do it for two weeks, and then I'm going to reevaluate and see whether my undertaking this project really improves my overall bottom line. And forget, don't forget, you have to evaluate the whole bottom, the bottom line. Not, can I keep this up for two weeks? Let's say, I'm going to get up an hour earlier in the morning, I'm going to learn before davening. Ah, great idea. But <clears throat> if I used to go to bed at 11 o'clock, and now I'm going to bed at 10 o'clock, and somebody comes to me at 10, 10 and asks me for advice. Uh, I'm tired. I got up at 6 this morning instead of 7. Advice? <sighs> Leave me alone. I can't take it. And then you become surly and unresponsible to other people's needs then maybe it wasn't a good idea. Yeah, you're getting up every day at 6 o'clock. But bottom line in your service of HaKadosh Baruch maybe it didn't improve. Uh, maybe it wasn't worthwhile. So if you do that, you don't risk the idea of being, de- being defeated by failure, and, um, and you will get feedback on yourself on what you can and cannot do. That's one way to get self-knowledge. <coughs> and the other is to consult with other people they could be peers who will see you more objectively than you see yourself. Don't ever think that you know yourself better than everybody else does. Uh, some of you know I'm not a big fan of a lot of contemporary psychology, but here they're certainly right. And people often see themselves in terms of their hopes or their fears or their wishes or their rationalizations and justifications and don't see themselves correctly. Taking counsel with other people um, in fact, we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight, is a very good idea. Or older people who've had a, a certain amount of life experience, and if you make the effort to get to know them, they should get to know you, and then you say, am I ready for this particular step? They can help you decide whether you are or you're not. And if you're not, then, um, then you shouldn't hold yourself uh, guilty if you don't take it. We had two boys here when I first came here, I first came here about 92 years ago. All right, it's a little exaggeration. It was 42 years ago. One boy had a ponytail, and one boy had an earring in his, his ear. Those were po- popular in those days. The progressive vanguard. Um, the boy with a ponytail, after six months, took it off, and we on the staff were very worried about him. We thought it was too early. It was too early. He wasn't ready for that. We don't know why he did it. And as far as I know, he didn't make it. Similar period of time, the boy with the earring took out his earring, and we also were worried that it was too early until we found out that he heard a lecture on Eved Nirza, 
the slave who's supposed to go free in the sixth year, he doesn't go in, he gets, a, he gets a whole board in his ear because he wasn't, he said, no, nah, I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want an earring in my ear. So we said, oh, okay. He had, I mean, he heard a, a lecture about a Jewish law and he applied it to himself and he made it. He made it. He's very successful, Baruch Hashem. So the fact that you're in a situation which needs to be changed doesn't mean it needs to be changed today. Uh, we had, a, someone told me this, a boy came to the yeshiva. Those, those days people dropped in for 12 hours. He slept over in, in, in a room with one of the yeshiva boys. In the morning, you know, the yeshiva boy got up at 7 to go to, to, to shul. He got up at 8.30 to eat breakfast. And the boy came back from davening. And the newcomer was standing in front of the, the, the mirror. He had lathered up his face. He had a stick razor. And he had shaved half his face. Ah! And the other half is still lathered up. And obviously, the yeshiva boy must have looked shocked. So the other one said, oh, is something wrong? And they asked me, what should he have said? He didn't, they didn't tell me what he did say. But as was, as I said, here's what you should have said. Uh, there is something to talk about, but now is not the time. And maybe someday we'll get to it. Don't tell him, don't shave your face! I'm into the eraser! God, that's terrible! You know, you're sinning against God. Don't tell him that. Don't tell him that. You told him there's something to talk about, so you're not telling him what he's doing is okay. You're not just passing it off. On the other hand, now's not the time for him to face that challenge. Chances are he's not going to be able to face that challenge. There's an order of development that's reasonable for people. So this, this is what we're, when we say that tshuva is only when you could have done better. Don't be trapped into the f thought that if I'm responsible, if Kaj Baruch Hu gave me the mitzvah, then I can always do better uh, and do perfectly. That's just, that's not true. The Torah is not, does not expect that of people. It's not, not realistic. And discovering what your capabilities are is a, it's difficult. It's difficult, it's subtle, and you could make mistakes and you have to live with the fact that you're not going to be omniscient and perfect in this like anything else.